Good okay, evening. Welcome. I think we're good. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. It's about 6.33. Um, my name is Dave Zomek. I'm the Assistant Town Manager here in Amherst, and I want to welcome everybody to the second uh, session as we focus on uh, uh, this wonderful site we have in downtown Amherst for uh, shelter and supportive housing. Um, it's great to be with you and bring back the Narrowgate team to share with you some of the um, some of the concepts that they've uh, come up with and, and they want to discuss with us tonight. I just want to take a, a moment to welcome everybody, community members, town staff, town council members, um, members of nonprofits and, and service providers. It's been wonderful to work with you all. We got uh, some months ago came together with over 50 people in the town room and, and got some wonderful feedback and uh, we're excited to present that to you tonight. Um, Working with our town manager, Paul Bachman, and with the support of the town council, you know, tonight's meeting is really all about reaffirming our, our town's commitment to developing a site for a permanent shelter and, and uh, permanent supportive housing to go along with that shelter. Um, my job tonight is really to quickly thank all of you for participating, um, thanking Craig's Doors and, and uh, their wonderful team there. Uh, thanking our many service providers who were part of that first meeting and met with uh, the team at the narrow gate. Um, also thanking our, our planning staff, um, Rob Mora and Nate Malloy uh, for their uh, input on this project. Special thanks, of course, to Greg. He's going to take it away from me here in a moment. Uh, he's he's really shepherded this project through and, and this this process. And then lastly, um, special, special thanks to the Narrowgate team. They've been wonderful to work with. Again, we're really excited to, to kick this off and, and take this to project to the next, next level of development. And again, these concepts uh, are, are exactly that. They are one idea uh, or a series of ideas that could happen on this site uh, just down, down the street from the town hall and, and uh, downtown Amherst. Uh, we're we're excited to see them tonight, and we're excited to kind of kick off the next phase of the process, which Greg will tell you about in a few minutes. So I think I'm going to turn it back to Greg. Again, thank you for participating, and thank you for being here tonight. So Greg, um, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, and hello again, everyone. I'm Greg Rochet. I'm an associate planner and housing coordinator with the town. Um, and uh, excited to talk about 457 Main Street tonight. I'm going to offer just a little bit of framing before we hand it over to our partners with the narrow gate. Um, so in Amherst, we have a goal to better meet the needs of folks who aren't served by our current housing market. Um, and uh, we do that in a lot of ways, uh, but uh, that includes some people, not really a lot of people. Um, and unfortunately, some of those folks um, experience homelessness. Um, and we want to help those folks. Um, stay safe uh, and um, supported in the short term. And in the long term, we want to help them find stable and dignified housing options that meet their needs uh, in the long term. So this is not news to anybody uh, uh, or, or to most people in the audience, probably. But there's many folks, uh, many of you all here tonight, uh, who've long been focused on that goal, um, including volunteers and staff of several organizations, both in Amherst and regionally. Um, you know, elected and appointed officials and any number of concerned residents uh, who make this a priority um, when they communicate with us in town on the town staff. Um, and one specific priority historically uh, for a while now has been to identify a permanent uh, location for a purpose-built shelter uh, for the town of Amherst. Um, and to address that objective, um, the town recently purchased the former VFW site uh, at 457 Main Street, which is what we're talking about tonight. Um, so our goal is to build something there that includes shelter space uh, that we've been seeking for a while, but also something that offers supportive housing um, that can be a long term option for those that might benefit from that. In the past couple of decades, um, this approach where we think beyond shelter, specifically to permanent solutions in the form of housing, have become a best practice nationally. And as you might expect, Massachusetts funding models um, now prioritize that approach. So that's kind of guiding our thinking here to some degree. So with that in mind, uh, that approach in mind, uh, in the spring, we engaged with the Narrowgate Architects, who you'll hear from shortly, um, uh, to explore the viability of this kind of approach at 457 Main Street. Um, and then tonight, we're going to hear about what they've been up to and the results of their work uh, and look at some conceptual designs uh, that they developed, you know, to, to uh, uh, 
you know, look at this site, you know, with this site in mind. So that's kind of the, the very quick background uh, and what we're up to here tonight. And uh, with that said, I think we're ready to hand it over to uh, the Narrow Gate. So I'm quite pleased to introduce Bob Wegner, Joe Lambert, and Sarah Briggs of the Narrow Gate. So Bob, Sarah, Joe, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, so I'm, I'm Bob and uh, I'm gonna, gonna kick it off here that we have a, a, a presentation for you here this evening that uh, after we're done with it, we're gonna have a, a Q and A at the end. So please uh, feel free to uh, store up your questions uh, at the end for the end of the presentation and we'll, we'll try to address those. I'm, I'm hoping and guessing that some of you may have um, been with us back in June when we had the, uh, the stakeholder meeting at, at the town hall, uh, which was a, a really vibrant uh, session as, as Dave was describing. And, and we were very appreciative that so many people turned up and so many people cared about what was gonna happen uh, on this site in your town. Um, so we, we hope that uh, some of what uh, you'll see tonight will uh, will reflect what happened that evening uh, because it was an important part of um, of the process here. So we want you to, to uh, kind of see this, uh, what, what's going on here is a, is a first step in a, in a long process. Um, we're gonna show you uh, th this process, it's a conceptual process as you've been hearing, and it's gonna, it led us to a conceptual building. So this building may not uh, actually end up being built or the building that does get built on the site may look different from what you see tonight. It's it's hard to say. So just imagine this as a concept. And for us, it was to kind of test the concept to see if the site was viable based on, on the program, based on the needs and all the things that you're gonna hear about tonight. So we'll go to the next slide if we can, Sarah. So, uh, you'll you see an aerial uh, photograph here with the site in the dash line, and you can see kind of the density of the site around here. So if we go to the next slide, our goals here were to, to take a look at the needs. And that was, uh, we got a lot of that from you. We're going to hear about how we went about this tonight. Joe's going to talk a lot about that uh, this evening. We studied uh, the site with different options. Sarah's going to talk about uh, that. And, and all this led to actually generating a conceptual design option, which we're really excited to share with you tonight. So we'll go to the next slide and uh, pass it along to Joe to talk about our uh, our needs and kind of initial programming process. Yeah, thanks, Bob. And uh, thanks everyone for being here. We're excited to share the work that we've done. From the beginning, we knew a large part of the design exercise would be defined by an information gathering process. Uh, we all wanted this process to be as well informed and well represented as possible. So, you know, together with officials from the town of Amherst, we held three primary stakeholder meetings, and, and they're kind of listed on the screen here. Uh, the first was an open public forum held at the town office in June. Uh, we also had a follow up meeting a few weeks after that with uh, local development experts and, and supportive housing experts. And then the, the final meeting was with Craig's Doors uh, and, and their leadership team. So we, we kind of uh, built on the information gathered in each of these meetings, uh, you know, towards putting together some kind of uh, conceptual design. And we we wanted to have all these meetings before we really even put pencil to paper. Uh, so tonight uh, we thought it'd make the most sense to kind of talk about what we learned. Um, and talk about the big takeaways and the big picture ideas from all these meetings that eventually kind of shaped the conceptual design that eventually Sarah is going to present uh, and, and show. So we can go to the next slide and talk about the first meeting and, and what we learned. So uh, Bob, Sarah, and, and Greg and I kind of orchestrated a, a conversation at the town hall where we divided you know, the, the conversation into four topics. Uh, we talked about building and site. We talked about connectivity and belonging. We talked about support services. We talked about housing and shelter and how these four different ideas um, could be thought about to kind of understand the need for a building like this in Amherst and also understand um, the potential of a building like this in Amherst and, and what it would look like and how it would feel. 
Uh, and, and the meeting was really well attended. And we got a lot of really good big picture thinking uh, out of it. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, and for those of you who are there, this is kind of what it looked like, you know, during the process and, and, and after the process. Uh, we really sought a lot of input. We wanted to hear what people were, were thinking. We recorded all these ideas uh, on post-it notes um, and then took those back to our office and went through kind of a distillation process. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we really listened, you know, to, to what people were saying and maybe surprisingly, maybe, maybe unsurprisingly, we heard near unanimous support for a number of issues at each table. Um, so if we go to the next slide, at the table talking about building and site ideas, we heard near unanimous support to maximize the development size possible on the site. Uh, there's a real need for the, for the services being offered here. And, and, and the idea was, is this site even big enough? You know, what, what can we fit on it? Can, can we make it bigger? Don't be afraid of density. We heard that. Um, we heard that, that uh, it was really important that the building have a welcoming presence on Main Street. And we heard that the development really prioritize safety and accessibility and have really purposeful, useful outdoor spaces. Uh, and also really account for the neighboring train tracks and the active railroad that's pretty close to the site. So if we go to the next slide. We, uh, we also talked about connectivity and belonging and how, um, how important it is to integrate the building and the development within the community, both visually and programmatically. We, we heard uh, unanimous support for flexible spaces uh, and, and the importance of facilitating relationships with external service providers rather than uh, maybe repeat redundant services that already existed somewhere else. And again, this idea of healthy outdoor space um, came up. So the third table, uh, we, we, did, we kind of orchestrated a conversation and, and, and recorded ideas that, that you all uh, you know, voiced about support services available. And again, we heard, we heard uh, the, the, the interest in avoiding redundancy with services elsewhere, maximizing the shelter and housing on the site, um, really focusing on the most essential services and, and creating flexible spaces. Um, and on the, on the next slide, uh, we kind of recorded some of the big picture ideas about housing and shelter. So this idea that um, shelter be combined with permanent supportive housing seemed to, to percolate to the top. Uh, and, and it really wasn't an either or approach, but, but both and the two of them. Um, we heard about the, the importance of affordable, accessible, age nimble housing that was dignified and person-centered and how important it was for, um, for, for, for accessibility uh, and, and, and uh, how the two supportive housing and shelter programs could, um, could share community services. So, you know, at this point, uh, we've done a lot of big picture thinking and listening to um, aspirational ideas about what the design could be. And we, we knew that uh, we, we need to take this uh, back to the ground. So, you know, we, we, with the town's uh, help, uh, we, we kind of facilitated a meeting with uh, development experts and uh, supportive housing experts. Uh, we had really good attendance from local developers, Wayfinders, and Valley CDC, as well as Mass Housing Shelter Alliance and the Center for Human Development, and kind of tested out the ideas that we were hearing from the, the public forum. And left this meeting actually feeling kind of optimistic. Because uh, if you go to the next slide, we really started to understand that this hybrid approach that combined permanent supportive housing and shelter uh, was actually the most financially viable model um, because the project could kind of um, fund itself through construction um, using means of funding permanent supportive housing. 
But then once the product was constructed, the services that were so important to the vitality of the project could be funded uh, through the shelter operation. So there's kind of a, a, a symbiotic relationship between these, these two program elements that kind of gets verified and, and backed up um, when looking at you know, the development costs and the operational costs. We also learned that there's an optimal unit count for permanent supportive housing. It really starts at 20, and then usually what developers are finding is that the, the target sweet spot is around 30 to 40 units, uh, which kind of aligned with some of our earlier site studies. You know, what, what can the site fit and, 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 and still be pretty dense, really? Um, you know, we also learned that uh, the, the number of shelter beds on the site uh, should be kind of maximized based on, you know, the, the input from, from the, the service providers. In this case, you know, we're, we're talking about Craig's doors. We also learned that administrative space and community space uh, really were, are seen as, as beneficial to developers who might sometimes struggle to find these types of spaces in their other projects. So these things all kind of aligned with what we were hearing in the first meeting, um, and they gave us kind of a platform to go into uh, our final meeting with Craig's Doors um, uh, and their leadership team. Uh, and uh, if we go to the next slide, we kind of spent you know probably a couple hours really drilling into what their program is now uh, and, and where they see it growing. Uh, and, and we're kind of looking for opportunities for um, the, 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 what we've learned before in, in the first two meetings uh, to kind of coincide with, uh, with what Craig's Doors needs. And, and this is another kind of moment in the process where we felt really optimistic that everything's kind of aligning uh, so that we can start to shape a building without really excluding the input that we're getting from any one of these parties or any one of these meetings. Um, you know, in, in this uh, screen, we're, we're kind of looking at a, a pretty condensed version of, of what Craig's Doors program offers. Uh, and some of this stuff is offered currently, and some of it, some of it is, is more uh, based on what a future building might, might hold for them. But even the services that are offered now uh, are, are, are spread out across disparate sites and, and maybe they don't have uh, access or, or a permanent home in, in the buildings that they do uh, you know, occupy. And, and that kind of creates a uh, vulnerability. Um, so kind of providing a building to, 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 to permanently house this program um, is really an important part of, of what, we're, what we're trying to uh, design for. Uh, also, we learned that, you know, the Craig's Doors team, you know, really uh, is making, making the most out of the spaces they have, but they're, they've outgrown the spaces they have and, and really aren't, aren't even uh, using, they don't have access to the type of administrative spaces that they, they really need. Um, so that was something that we really wanted to, to work into a, a new design for the building um, and, and really think about, you know, what, what does, what does a, a functioning, healthy, vibrant, uh, you know, building feel like? And how, how are these spaces kind of worked in uh, to, to kind of future-proof uh, the, the program? Um, so... You know, having done all this work, having having gone through these three meetings uh, and taking you know all this information in, uh, we kind of felt like we had what we we needed to go, you know, back into the design process with the town and and really kind of test out some different ideas. Uh, and we had a really productive process with Greg and and uh, and um, and Dave and Rob and Nate. Uh, where we kind of tweaked the, the assumptions that we made at first and, and kind of worked towards integrating all these ideas that we heard from both the first stakeholders meeting with the public open forum, uh, the development experts and Craig's doors, and, and eventually kind of arrived at a conceptual design 
that we feel really good about. And, and Sarah is going to talk you through it. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Sarah. Yeah. I'll, so now I will uh, sort of talk you through how we got from all of this uh, information that we collected that Joe just shared with you and how we got to a building from that. Um, and so one option of a building that might address all of these things would look something like this. Uh, <laughs> as Bob mentioned, it's it's just a conceptual design, but um, but uh, so to to start, one of the first things we looked at, one of the biggest moves on this site was uh, where to locate the shelter and the permanent supportive housing. Um, once we've agreed that we want both of those components, how do we fit both of those on this site? Um, and one thing that we heard at the first stakeholders meeting, at the public meeting that um, resonated, I think, that stuck was uh, one person used the phrase, don't hide us. Um, and and that was a really big part of the design throughout is sort of creating uh, an entry to the site um, that that is welcoming and that that sort of celebrates the project. Um, and from that, we started studying the shelter being at the front of the site. Um, and we found that that kind of works in a couple ways. Um, so that sort of orients the the shelter to the front of the site where there's more pedestrian traffic, public transit, um, shuttle drop off, uh, whereas the permanent supportive housing is at the rear and it has better access to more parking. Um, but another thing that uh, happens with that is the shelter um, ends up having a, a little bit of a smaller footprint and it's something that we really uh, like to keep to two stories if we can, just to have um, proximity of functions to each other and, and not having to navigate a super complex building or anything. Um, uh, whereas the, the permanent supportive housing has the potential at least to take up more space. Um, so, so locating the shelter at the front of the site here, you can see the lowest part of the building um, is at the entry and then you have a little step back to the shelter and then a little step back we might have you know higher level windows for privacy and for flexibility at the at the shelter and then the biggest step up is we have the the permanent supportive housing all the way at the back of the site and so the the bigger uh building that's a little bit less in scale with the surroundings is really back among all of these trees and it actually it, it fits in pretty well with that scale um, and you get this this gradual stepping back um and the other thing that we studied on this site we're, we're starting to look at some uh some challenges that the site brings and uh if any of you are familiar with the site probably the the challenge you are familiar with is the railroad um, it's not a super high traffic railroad or anything. I believe it's maybe twice a day that it goes through, but you know, it's we're 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 quite close there. <laughs> and um and additionally, if you are familiar with the site, you might not realize uh a, a second uh limitation that it has, which is it it looks a little bit well. You can't tell quite how deep it is, so we do have a little more space than you might think. But but it also is it seems a bit wider. Uh, but in fact, some of this parking along the side is not really within our site limits. That's sort of a we'll say informal <laughs> development at the moment. That's actually owned by the railroad, and so the frontage we actually have on Main Street is actually pretty limited. And we kind of want to do a lot in that space. We want to get people into the site for parking. Uh, drop off loading, um, and we also want to, like we said, entry is is a really important component of this design, and we want to have a good pedestrian experience. Um, so, so we're we're focusing on a good experience here. We're of uh, we're uh, locating the driveway along the west side of the site here, so that we can pull the building as far away from the the railroad as possible, and we'll have. Um, some kind of an acoustic barrier to be to be designed. Um, but 
and we'll have acoustic uh, treatments in the building itself as well, you know, windows and and uh, high STC rated walls and stuff. But but the first step is um, doing as much as we can with the site arrangement itself to to help with that. Um, and then so getting to uh, another slightly more granular uh, scale of development here, getting into what's inside the building. Um, and this comes largely from that program developed with uh, with Craig's doors. We had some great, like very granular data that we got from them, but we've also, um, you know, uh, brought that brought in some some stuff from our first stakeholders meeting and our developers. Um, and a lot of the the interior of this is flexible. Um, for example, you know, here we have uh, some like social services and dining, and maybe those are flipped. Maybe the dining is really in this corner. Um, but some pieces are a little bit more. Uh, I apologize for the light show happening in my room right now. Um, <laughs> some components of the design are are located in a really um, conscious way, especially the entries and um, the way that the portions of the building that interact with the exterior. And, uh, and uh, one thing that we're doing in shaping the building is also shaping the exterior spaces. Um, so I've already talked a bunch about the entry plaza. We want it to be welcoming. We want it to, you know, we want to have clear wayfinding. We want it to be recognizable from the street. Um, and then the next space back, we have a, a sort of sheltered outdoor waiting space. Um, so that, you know, at peak, uh, at peak traffic times, if you might need to wait outdoors, you are sheltered a little bit from from the weather with a with a an awning, but also a little bit pulled off the street. You don't feel like you're just waiting on the sidewalk here, but you're still sort of entering into the same space. You're still it's still easy to find from the street. Uh, the wayfinding is is clear. Um, then we have uh, uh, the primary entry to the permanent supportive housing. We also have a rear entry, but this is sort of the main entry. We'll have like mail, bike parking, that kind of thing has its own dedicated entry as well as being able to enter through the, the shelter. Um, and then we have our two sort of backyard type spaces. Um, there's a shared yard here between the shelter and the PSH which we're envisioning potentially having outdoor dining. That's a nice use for that space. And then there's the the backyard at the rear of the site that's just um, accessed through the, the, the uh, permanent supportive housing. Um, and then uh, looking at the upper floors and how that translates. So the shelter, again, it's a more limited footprint, um, whereas the, the permanent supportive housing can go up you can really stack the floors <laughs> sort of as many as you uh, can fit by zoning. Um, but we have uh, our shelter is planned for 40 shelter beds. Um, that's mostly in bunk beds and it might be split by gender and that, but that's to be determined. We've also factored in space for, you know, an appropriate amount of shower facilities and um and there's also some adjacent admin space uh which is helpful for just proximity for some some things um and then uh then at each floor of the permanent supportive housing building we have 10 units um and one of those is uh you might call an ADA unit a group two accessible unit so that's a fully accessible unit and the rest of them are all considered adaptable. Um, so they're all elevator accessible. They're all sort of visitable um, and they are all adaptable, but but we'll have um, one fully accessible unit per floor. Um, and uh, and then we I, we just have um, getting into the the breakdown of how the the square footage adds up for all of these these different spaces um we have a total of 40 beds a total of 30 
permanent supportive housing units, um, a total of 20 parking spaces, um, and uh, and then I will uh, share some more images with you. Um, you know, again, it's it's conceptual. Um, we don't know what the siding color is going to be, but um, <laughs> but you can see how uh, the very first uh, mass of this building actually kind of fits pretty well with with our next door neighbor here in terms of scale, um, and how that steps up as you go backwards. Um, and, uh, and this is another view, um, you know, you get the, the pedestrian sequence of entry, and then you get the vehicular sequence of entry. Uh, and then we just have an aerial view so you can sort of see all of the different components of the building in, in context here. Um, and, uh, oops, whoa. sorry. <laughs> and Bob is going to talk to you now about, uh, about the next steps in this process. Okay, thanks. So uh, a big big part of this was, will it work? Is it viable? And uh, if we go to the uh, to the next slide there, Sarah, so uh, the answer is yes, it is it is viable. This can be done. This can be done to achieve that threshold of uh, permanent supportive housing units, uh, the shelter space, you know of of the forty beds and all the other um, uses that would be a part of the the uh, the shelter facility. Uh, there's there's parking that's adequate space adequate space for parking for adequate parking and there's also a nice scale to it you know this this idea of trying to make sure that it fits within the context the uh, the single family context uh, that Sarah talked about the front of the building and then stepping up at the back so we we conclude from our study after uh, going through this process this has been going on I think maybe four or five months that. The site is a viable site to achieve the uh, uh, meet the the goals and the needs that uh, that we've uh, we've studied and heard from all the stakeholders. So, what are the challenges? Let's go to the next slide. The challenges and next steps. We've got limited frontage. You know, we talked about that. You can see that's a site plan there. The the building on the right there, the upper right, that's the VFW hall. And as Joe talked about earlier, there's not a whole lot of frontage, but we feel like it can still work. We can still get that vehicular entry. We can still have pedestrian entry and we can still get parking on the site, even with that limited frontage. The railroad is certainly a challenge, you know, uh, you know so, so things can be done to mitigate noise. Um, there might want to be some kind of vibration study just to see how much uh, the, the ground is, is vibrating or feels the impact of trains going by. There hasn't been any geotechnical studies done yet. Uh, that would be a next step to see if the soil, what the conditions of the soil are and what kinds of foundations would be needed. There, you can see from the, the plan here, you see all those lines at the rear, the kind of U-shaped uh, portion. It's pretty steep at that part of the site. There'd be some regrading and some places where the, the site will slope rather steeply. Um, so depending on how that gets used, some additional retaining walls might be needed there. And then as far as next steps, it's finding partners. Uh, we talked about in the beginning, development partners to take on the project and to operate the facilities as, are, as they are next steps. We thought uh, some folks might be interested in, in the timeline. You can see how long it's been going on. Uh, you know, the, the town of Amherst uh, started on this back in 2010. Here we are 14 uh, years later, and we're looking at these, these conceptual design studies. So what happens after this step? Well, uh, the town, Greg had mentioned, there'll be an RFP at some point that will go out and a developer gets selected. And then uh, permitting is kind of a next step after after a, a design is, is completed, uh, it goes to the building department for permitting. Uh, the developer will put together a funding package uh, to, to fund this, both the, uh, the construction financing and permanent financing. And then at some point down the road, construction begins and it could take uh, easily a year, maybe a year and a half uh, for construction. So that gives you a sense of, of next steps. Um, 
for um, for the development of this site. So that really concludes our presentation. But uh, the, the second half here, we wanted to open it up to, to questions to uh, to any of you who, who are, are listening in, um, get your thoughts on it, things that maybe you're, you're still wondering about that aren't clear or that uh, you think uh, would be beneficial to, um, to the next steps. I think, Greg, are you able to handle uh, questions from anybody? Are you able to give you a signal? Sure, or yeah. Hand up? Um, yeah, and um, let's see, we've got a couple hands up um, uh, and one request uh, to name participants, um, uh, which I think we can do. Um, uh, let's see, and, and uh, looks like uh, John has a question and I'll come back and uh, in share participants, but I'm gonna go ahead and uh, give John uh, the mic here. I've got you twice here, John, so I'm going to allow you to talk and hopefully it works. Go ahead. Oh. So, John, you'll have to unmute yourself and hopefully you can ask a question then. Huh. Let's try this one. <laughs> John's got two screens open, I think. I okay. just unmuted myself. There we go. Um. Two, two questions. One is, um, what can be fitted into a single unit of the permanent supported housing and how large is that unit likely to be? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, you said that the shelter space itself would be primarily uh, bunked beds. Is there any way of assuring some privacy to people within the shelter space? Hmm. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, let's start with the, with the bunk beds. There is uh, a way to create some privacy. Um, uh, you know, we've, we've done quite a bit of work with uh, different organizations that provide uh, shelter um, in the greater Boston area, um, some in, with Father Bills in Quincy, some with Pine Street Inn in Boston. And uh, some places, the you know the it's it's more open, and there there is a lack of privacy, and sometimes that that can feel uh, I don't know uh, less less humane or less uh, personal. And so what we developed uh, on the Father Bill's project was to put up some partitions that make for these little alcoves. They're not rooms per se, but they are partitions that separate one bunk from the next uh, that give uh, people some privacy. So. Some of the folks uh, in the town were able to, to go to Quincy to visit that. And I think um, it was it was helpful to see how that was set up. So that's that's one response anyway to uh, to privacy for the bunks. Uh, for the um, the permanent supportive housing, those what we've shown you there are studio uh, apartments and they're about three, 350 square feet. Uh, they'll have a full bathroom in them. Uh, Sarah said uh, one of the units will, will actually be a little bit larger because it'll be fully accessible, but they have a full bathroom. Uh, they can have a little kitchenette with a, a two burner stove and a uh, uh, you know refrigerator. Um, and uh, they have enough space for a, a bed and some a furniture and a small table. So, We've we've done this uh, in several projects, and they're they're really quite nice units. You know, they're 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 spacious enough for one person. You know, they have storage, they have a storage closet as well uh, that can be a part of it. Okay, thank you. Yes. Anyone else? Hey. Um, and we have uh, Laura Baker. Hi, Laura. Go ahead, Laura. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So I um, wondered if I could offer some comments and also some questions. Um, I'm really impressed by this design. I think it's excellent work on your part, uh, balancing a lot of the site constraints and the programmatic priorities that were identified. Um, I like the scale of it. I like the buffer that's created between the building and the railroad. Uh, I like the nice private backyard for the uh, permanent supportive housing. Um, 
I have a question about the, you have space for dedicated to permanent supportive housing on the ground floor of that four-story building. And I was just curious what you envisioned in that space there. Um, it looks like because your buildings are somewhat separated that uh, you'll need multiple elevators to serve the building. And I'm just noting that. I, I don't know that there's a way to do it better. <laughs> Um, but on the operational side, um, it does create an expense uh, for the property to have two separate elevators to, to maintain. Um, yeah, the blue spaces that are on that ground floor, I just wasn't sure if there was something in mind. I, first, I thought there were more units, but then in your unit count, I see that they're common space. So just curious. Um, I think in terms of suggestions, um, I know that this is primarily kind of a massing study. I also know that this site is really close to historic district. So just some thought to not necessarily making it look like a historic building, but giving it some New England traditional elements might make it feel better uh, for people in the community. Um, and then I would go ahead and build out, maximize the amount of PV that you could put on these nice flat roofs um, that you've drawn here. Um, mm -hmm. But I love the balance of indoor and outdoor space. I'm amazed that you got 20 parking spaces on here. Um, I don't know if you've done any turning studies or fire truck access studies. It, it you know, it's tight. Um, but I've always envisioned kind of a separate but connected for these two uses um, and that for example the dining area could potentially serve both people in shelter as well as people who might be living in permanent supportive housing mm -hmm. um, so really nice job thank you hmm. yeah thanks for all the thoughtful uh, input Laura I'm, I'm going to ask Sarah if she could talk a little bit about the uh, the ground floor spaces uh, in the in the back building, the uh, PSH building. Yeah, yeah. So some of it is um, uh, pretty. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's all of it is schematic. You know, it'll it'll depend a little bit on um, the the particular uh, operations and and how they want to use this space. Um, some of it is pretty standard we'll have a uh, mail room we'll have um bike storage i guess i called that out specifically we'll have laundry and um yep. uh yeah okay. <laughs> the basics and then um we at uh at father bills they have kind of a number of different um common areas there's sort of a common room as well as a library again we you know we'll see how uh they feel about different spaces but maybe at least one of these could be a common room area and then um it may be the case that there wants to be a uh housing specific office for the permanent about permanent supportive housing um mm -hmm. might be one of these spaces <laughs> um but yeah some essentials and then some of it is is uh flexible and right now you're showing an interior corridor that just flows freely between the ground floor of the permanent mm -hmm. supportive housing over to the shelter side. Um, yeah. I can and imagine they, one, one might sorry. choose to lock that down so that, you know, mm -hmm. tenants have their own space with a fob or a key to get in separate from where more of the general public is circulating. That's right. Yeah. I think that, I think that's correct. There, there would be some, uh, some secure uh, mm -hmm. uh, what barrier there between the two or doorway between the two. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, other things that, and again, this this is all very conceptual and as it moves into the next phase and gets into what we would call schematic design, more program, more programmatic uh, uses would, would uh, hopefully uh, rise. You know, some of them might be, if there is kind of a common space or a common room, we'd need bathrooms for it too. So there would be, uh, probably uh, you know two bathrooms associated with that that need to be accessible. So these are these are very early notions of of what might go on in the ground floor. Laura, was there another uh, question that uh, you had asked that we have not yet answered? Oh, I think I'm good. Thank you. Okay, thanks. 
Thanks, Laura. Um, and uh, I've got a couple of questions um, and notes in the um, uh, in the the Q and A. Um, so, Bruce, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, uh, figure out how to reply um, to your question of who's in the room. Uh, I'm going to reply to your question, and folks can can look to the Q and A um, and and look to the reply to Bruce's question on, on, under it for names. Um, if you don't want to be named for some reason, uh, uh, maybe just, um, um, well, I'm going to name you, so it's, it's okay. <laughs> um, uh, and Tim uh, McCarthy made a note, um, unfortunately he's double booked, um, but he noted that his appreciation uh, and wanted to thank them, uh, the Narrowgate team and um, and the team at the town. Um, and then on to some specific questions, um, uh, uh, Jane Mares has asked, um, you know, what's the difference between adaptable units and fully ADA compliant units for the permanent supportive housing? Um, and how adaptable are the adaptable units for uh, people with disabilities? That's the first of our questions. Does somebody want to speak to that? Sure. Sarah, do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. On? Um, so, I mean, <laughs> it's all very exciting stuff. There's um, certain clearances that we that are only in a group two uh, unit per the ADA and the uh, Massachusetts. Uh, actually, I forget exactly what the MAAB stands for. <laughs> but, architectural uh, Access, yeah. Architectural Access Board. Thank you. Board, yeah. Um, yeah, so there are some there are some bigger turning circles that are required in group two units, and those you aren't going to really get into the adaptable units. That would be uh, a large change. But um, all of the vanities, for example, you have removable cabinets under the sinks um, for knee space. You um, have to. Uh, build uh such that some doors can be reversible um they might swing into the bathroom but um if you want to uh adapt it to fully accessible you'll flip the flip the swing and um there's yeah what else is there anything else you can think of those are some of the highlights the the, yeah. the adaptable units are still not as accessible. They're just a, a little bit smaller, but uh, there are things that can be done to make them more accessible mm -hmm. um, if the need be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those those group one units or the adaptable units are constructed at the time that they're built uh, to be flexible and, and, and to be modified to become more accessible uh, if needed. Um, where the, the group two units are, are, are built with bigger tolerances from the get-go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and, and Jane has a follow-up question too, um, uh, and let's read. Uh, the shared yard uh, for the shelter residents and the PSH residents looks so small, especially compared to the one for the, for the PSH folks only. Uh, might that become larger? Hmm. Let's go back to that plan so uh, oh, sure. everyone can yeah. see it. Um, yeah, I will say as, as one thing, I think that, um, the site looks a little smaller than, <laughs> than it is when you actually start placing maybe a furniture layout would have helped to, to scale some stuff. Um, um, a lot of, uh, what I did when I was laying this stuff out was um, we have sort of a, a precedent that we worked on at, at Father Bill's, um, uh, basically taking the spaces that we have there and cutting them in half. <laughs> and they actually have more than twice the the space in the shelter. Um, so I think it's I think it's a, a a pretty good at least the outdoor dining space. Um, is is a pretty good amount of space but it is true that uh if you're using it for both outdoor dining and the yard yeah it could um it could be reconfigured and it's also you know the the way that the backyard is is used is not necessarily an exclusively private um yeah it's a yeah, I think, I think there was a lot of focus on outdoor space, kind of um, especially starting at the first stakeholders meeting. And 
the, the, the words that really stuck with me are that this idea of purposeful outdoor space, not just outdoor space for the sake of outdoor space, but but really useful, usable outdoor spaces. Um, so I think to really to really maximize that type of environment, you really have to have deeper conversations with the developer, with the operator, the service providers, and really think about you know what these outdoor spaces are serving. You know, how do we how do we make usable space that's inviting to people, but not just kind of abandoned empty green space. So I think those are the kinds of things that as this project goes through a, a real design process. Um, will be really important to maintain, you know, and keep exploring those relationships and uh, what is the right uh, balance and scale between the shared private yard and, and the rear private yard and, and what are they used for, you know? Um, I think I think those are things that we've started to hint at, but really like everything in this plan, there's a lot more thinking um, that, that's ahead, you know, if, if, if this project is green lighted. I'll add on top of that, that uh, the, the PSH outdoor space looks larger and it is in plan, but some of it's not very usable because of the slope, you know, where those trees are. That's a very steep slope. And we also wanted to uh, allow for a little uh, potential expansion of parking if needed or turnaround space. Somebody mentioned uh, fire trucks. You know, it's possible that we will we'll need some more space uh, for that as well. So there is there is some consideration for if that if that paved area for uh, fire truck access or more parking is needed, there is a little bit of room to expand that at the back of the site. Or alternately, uh, we could have less parking. <laughs> there was definitely there were some some people right. supporting no parking on the site, so you know you could get in instead get extra uh, outdoor space that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll follow that uh, comment about um, the, the slope of the site uh, with uh, Calvin Ellis's question, uh, which is, um, given the steep slope of the site, uh, have you considered building below grade or partially below grade level? We did think about that. Um, and, and some of the options that we studied uh, really relied on that, that we had different approaches to where we might come into the site. We studied coming in on Railroad Street, which didn't prove to be uh, a, a really um, good option uh, in, the, in the end. And we thought about some parking below grade. Uh, but I would, I would also add on top of that, that the parking below grade is, is a more expensive, um, uh, what, approach to parking than just surface parking. So we were trying to keep an eye on, on budget as well um, by not be building a structured parking or below grade parking, because as, as most folks know, construction is really expensive and getting funds for affordable housing is a challenge. So we'll, we'll try to keep that in mind as we design things you know, uh, around the site, particularly uh, you know, parking and other uh, site design features. Great. Um, and then uh, a few uh, briefer ones. Um, I'll type out some answers in some cases. Um, uh, so uh, uh, John uh, Hornick has a couple more questions. Um, uh, what is envisioned for the third floor above the shelter? Um, I don't believe in this case we have a third floor in the shelter space up front. Um, and you can tell me if I'm, I'm misinterpreting <laughs> that question. Um, um, and then is there a way to carve out a little more ground floor space for clients in the shelter? Not quite. And what um, is that again, Greg, a little more. Um, is, is, is there a way to, to carve out a little more ground floor space for clients in the shelter? Um, and John, maybe I can just let you talk here. Do you mean um, uh, more um, like program space in the ground floor of the shelter for, for usage by clients of the shelter? Is, is that? Actually, that wasn't my question. I'm not quite sure. How... Oh, oh, maybe you Perhaps, perhaps you forwarded your invite to somebody else, uh, and they, um, um, and 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 their name is popping up here. Uh, your name is popping up with their question. Um, so, uh, if anybody wants to, who, if somebody wrote that um, uh, and who received an invite from John, if you could clarify, if you mean, uh, is there more? Are you, are you asking for more program space uh, on the the ground floor? 
Um, uh, and Bob, can we uh, can we share a, a copy of the presentation? Uh, sure. Certainly this will... Yeah, after after the yeah. Back. Well, yeah. And, and, and this recording will be posted uh, as well. Um, yeah. um, I'll probably put it on the um, the Housing Trust website as well as the Town YouTube channel. Yeah. yeah. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe... Greg, uh, Joe could speak to that. I think in some ways that question is kind of a, a programmatic question. And we, we approach this trying to establish a preliminary program through one of our, our stakeholder meetings. So, Joe, do you want to uh, talk about that uh, additional program space? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think those are the kinds of things that we really look forward to in, in future design processes. Um, you're kind of working out what's right for for the developer and the service provider um so you know, i think what we've tried to do is, is really create um spaces that, that that have good connection to to outdoor spaces and and, and adjacency to, to green space um so as far as the services that are that are you know potentially occurring on, on the ground floor of the shelter space um you know, we have some some rough ideas of, of what those might be based on our conversations with Craig's doors. Um, and we have certainly more than enough space to be adaptable and flexible as those needs change. Mm -hmm. um, but really this is this is kind of just um, it's a sketch. It's a it's a loose idea of, of a building that that is really meant to start conversations just like the one we're having now, you know, and 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 then the conversation will lead us uh, to potentially relooking at, at at how much space is needed, you know, on the ground floor uh, for clients, and, and and what that space needs to needs to you know serve and perform how it needs to perform. So I think that's uh, the exciting the exciting part of what comes next. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we that we learned during the uh, process is. Um, that uh, the funding for we talked about how um, the the permanent supportive housing uh, tends to subsidize the construction and then the shelter tends to get funding on an ongoing basis. And that uh, ongoing funding is based on a number of beds that that uh, the the operation manager is, is licensed for. And we learned that uh, Craig's Doors is currently uh, funded for 38 beds. So that's kind of where that 40 beds number came from. Um, and then um, uh, the, the services are sort of proportional to that. And that's based largely on uh, the information we got from Craig's Doors. But some of it, especially the stuff more on the permanent supportive housing and this is also based a little bit on our experience in other buildings where you know given x number of people how much how much bathroom space is required by uh by code and then how much is actually used is is it you know, do they find that they need more showers than that um and uh uh so which is all to say uh that it's a it's a it's a it's an example it's a study and 40 is a sort of arbitrary number but um you know if we found that we could get funding for a higher number then then the uh then the space could be reconfigured to we have we haven't we could we could make it work with more <laughs> we could we could jam some more stuff in here if we wanted to I think there was a question too about a possible third floor above the shelter. Um, right mm -hmm. now, we're not thinking there's need for that uh, based on the, you know, the, the, the programmatic exercise we went through. But um, there was also comments about uh, solar uh, PV or solar arrays, and and that's you know certainly with all these flat roofs, uh, it would be the ideal, and we'd get I think uh, some pretty good. Uh, solar orientation, although we'd have to also be careful uh, looking at, we've got the four-story building in the back and look at a shadow study to see how much uh, shadow is, is cast by the four-story building onto the lower roofs. But there is a, there's a one-story connector there in between where that dining room is. Um, uh, but the, uh, the, the rest of the, the two-story building, I would think it's, it's 
quite likely that we could uh, put solar panels there. Yeah. In this view, you can see there is kind of a popped up roof over mm -hmm. the shelter program towards the front of the site. Um, and that's not a full third floor. It, it's really a, a clear story uh, story that that uh, allows light to come in above the, the the bunk space, the dorm space, partly to allow for more privacy for for those spaces, but also to allow a more flexible floor plan. Um, so again, it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a loose idea of what might work, um, but the, there is some 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 thoughtfulness that we put into it. Um, so maybe maybe that's where the 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 misconception was that, that there might be a third floor mm -hmm. on the shelter. That makes sense. Yeah. This image is um, also pretty good at showing where the shadow from the four-story building. You can see, I don't, I'm not sure what time of day this is, but you can see the shadow being cast uh, on mm -hmm. the on the lower roof there, the dining room uh, connecting mm -hmm. roof. Yeah, this is, um, our plans are uh, pretty much due north. So so we have um, a, a very nice south facing yard here and then the north the the main entry is um going to be in shadow a lot of the time but. um and a, a a question here um uh and I don't believe it's from John but uh I'll it doesn't <laughs> matter who it's from actually but uh but how would the program affect residents of railroad street uh, as a question mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully uh, as little as possible. Um, we definitely had some some earlier schemes that were quite that were trying to 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 bring some um, traffic through here because it's you know if you don't have to do both traffic in and out, you can get a little more space um, at Main Street. But that felt uh, like it was going to be very disruptive. Um, so we've 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 pulled back from that a lot. Um, I don't know. Did yeah, you know? I think the reality is that, that there there is kind of an awkward relationship between our site and the the kind of the residential site that our site encircles. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think uh, putting our, our parking where we have it kind of keeps the building far away from from that. Um, a neighboring site, um, you know, where, where the, the grade change is on the, the, the southeast corner of the site, it's pretty heavily wooded. Um, and I, th I think, you know, for, from that perspective, uh, this development wouldn't really be disruptive to the neighbors on a few sides, but um, looking at the, the neighbor to the, directly to the east, um, you know, we are we are against the the, the setback on that property line. Um, I think you mean on the west, Joe? Is that right? On the east. Yeah. Oh, on the east. Okay, that. Yeah, the east and 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 the, with the west too. You know, where where our site kind of wraps yeah. around the, the neighbor site. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah, can you go to the early slide that shows a little wider context? People can see. Uh, oh yes, yeah. The... the very beginning, yeah. You can kind of see the rest of the the neighborhood there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely. Um, well, we're at an interesting corner here, sort of between. Um, we have we have some a lot of uh, one and two family housing, and then this is it actually uh, in a zoning study earlier where the site is actually split between two uh zoning districts between residential and commercial and uh sort of to the west over here it's getting very commercial and to the north it's it's larger multifamily um so it is at a at a very interesting uh spot um we're navigating that that change a little bit yeah um, uh, and a concrete question from Laura. Um, what's the total gross square feet uh, of, of the building that we're looking at right now? That is a good... It's a little... Um, 
Sarah, those numbers, I added them up. It's a, that was, if we add all those numbers up, and I'm not sure if that includes everything or not, or those just the main spaces. I don't know if that includes circulation. Yeah, sorry, that's, that is everything except circulation space, which uh, I don't have a... Yeah, so if we took, if we're, if we're trying to get a ballpark on it, um, or it, it's probably around 25,000 square feet, you know, plus or minus, just to give you a, a rough sense. Great. Okay, so I think I think I've hit uh, just about the question. There's a few comments in the Q and A, um, uh, but I think all the concrete questions that folks have offered um, we've addressed. Um, and I will just note that, um, as we've heard many, many times, we're in a conceptual looking at conceptual product here, um, and that means that a lot of these questions or a lot of these comments that we're getting tonight, which which will be recorded in, in this presentation. Um, you know, will inform future work on this effort. Um, so, uh, um, you know, for example, we might, you know, the size of the yards could change. Perhaps we end up with some accessible units on the first floor of the, the permanent supportive housing rear of the building, um, any number of, of possibilities. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, important to know we're, we're still in process here. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, I think, I, I, now I think, oh, Dave's got a hand up. Go ahead, Dave. Yep. Greg, I just wanted to reemphasize that, you know, of course this session is being recorded. That'll be available, I think, uh, Laura and some other folks asked about this presentation. And of course we'll work with the narrow gate and through you, Greg, to post this on our website. Where will this mm -hmm. live? Is this on the Housing Trust website, the town website, both? Maybe you could say a bit about that. And of course, we'd be willing to get this out to, you know, others in the community and make it as accessible as possible. So I just wanted to see if you could say a bit about about that. For sure, and uh, and yeah, the answer is uh, yes. I think uh, uh, in the meantime, um, uh, we'll probably house um, information about this. Certainly, this presentation will link from the uh, the Amherst Municipal Housing Trust website. Um, and then uh, uh, eventually, as this grows into an even bigger project of its own, probably it would get its own uh, web page um, on our site. Um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, and then also, you, you know, these will go live. We'll, we'll probably have this presentation online uh, within, hopefully within 48 hours or so. Uh, and uh, if there's others you think might appreciate uh, reviewing what we've got here, by all means, uh, please direct them to our website. And I'll finally, I'll note as well, um, uh, accompanying um, uh, the, this presentation, the narrow gate has also developed um, a written narrative uh, with some of the same images and uh, lots of the same information, um, you know, which, you know, will be, you know, in PDF format. So uh, we'll have this, uh, this product available in a variety of ways. Great. Are we, do you think we're ready to wrap here? Any more questions coming in, Greg, that you can see? I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, 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 uh, get, uh, Jerry, I'll drop you a line. Thank you for that. Um, uh, and we will connect. Um, um, and uh, no, but I think we've got, uh, I don't think I see any more questions. Um, a few comments, which folks are welcome to review um, and um, and thank you for all of them. Um, and I'm just going to peek over at the participant side. And John, I think you got your hand up from before, or one of the <laughs> one of the Johns uh, might have their hand up from before. But I suspect those are from old questions and uh, ha haven't lowered a hand. So I think we are in good shape here. Um, uh, unless, uh, yeah, I think we're looking good. Could um, I so, maybe just say, yeah. One thing, Greg? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, First of all, moving forward, I think, Greg, you will continue to be our main contact for the project. So if people on the call or viewing this later have questions, you can reach Greg uh, at Town Hall. Uh, you can find him on our website and, and he is easily accessible. I just want to again thank Bob and Joe and Sarah for the work on this over the past few months. It's been wonderful 
you know, uh, collaborating with you. And uh, I'm just excited uh, to, to have these, this study and, and all the work that went into this. And I think it provides a great foundation for us to, to kind of launch forward into a likely RFP process. Um, I'm not sure if Greg, you're gonna say anything about next steps, but I'll, I'll wrap and turn it back to you, Greg, by just thanking you for, again, for shepherding this through and uh, getting us to this point. And we're just excited to look forward to uh, the next year and and uh, new uh, steps in this process. So I'm not sure, Greg, if you were gonna say for our audience, where do we go from here? Sure. I there was a timeline earlier, but maybe you could wrap by saying, where do we go? Sure, that'd be great. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'll just um, echo Dave and uh, thank everybody he thanked, and also just uh, thank the folks who've been working on uh, on um, shelter and supporting um, uh, different folks uh, who you know who have housing challenges uh, in town um, of all types. Um, and I know there's many people who've been doing that for a long time. So thank you for doing that and for your input um, into this specific effort. Um, so. You know, as you heard Bob share, uh, what's really exciting is the fundamental fact we identified here is that this is viable, which is super exciting uh, and uh, really promising for um, where we're headed. Um, you know, and the next step, um, as you know, was noted on the slide, is that you know the town now is sort of moving into a period of due diligence where um, we've got to work with the various stakeholders in town to understand, um, you know, what they're up for, uh, what they're um, you know, how they might relate to this project, um, you know, you know, what kind of collaborations might emerge. We're going to have to look, uh, you know, uh, what capacities exist in the services and housing sectors in town right now and and what uh, need to emerge in order to execute something like this um, and, uh, you know, follow, you know, guidance from state sources and so forth. So there's a fair amount of, of due diligence uh, to do here. Um, but uh, it, it's uh, it, what's exciting is that we're um, you know, we're getting a green light from this important initial stage here. So um, so once, you know, we've, we've kind of done that work with uh, a variety of stakeholders, um, some of whom are on tonight, um, you know, we'll uh, move towards some sort of RFP process, which will be informed by that, uh, that communication with those stakeholders. So basically we've surveyed the site. Now it's time to survey the community in, in the best way to go forward. And that's kind of the next step here. Um, so, uh, but certainly, as as Dave mentioned, by all means, reach out to me if you have questions or you'd like to be more explicitly involved in this effort. Um, and uh, and I'll just note too uh, a minor plug. Um, uh, another way to be involved in housing efforts in Amherst is through participating in our uh, housing production plan effort, which is underway right now. Um, in fact, on Tuesday the first, you can join a meeting um, at uh, the Woodbury Room in the library. Um, uh, and that uh, is advertised in the town website's calendar, um, but to offer some input into the town's housing production plan, uh, which would be inclusive of this, but also much broader looking at affordable housing efforts um, uh, across the board. Um, and we'd love all of your input in that. Um, so with that, uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll call it, uh, I'll offer a conclusion here and, and thank everybody for joining us. All right. Thanks everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night.